Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to continue our Old Testament survey as we look now at the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. You remember we left off with the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 586 BC, um, and that begins this period of the Babylonian captivity. Now we can we can trace that those years in a variety of ways. Either we can look at the time when the temple was destroyed. Notice uh, the return from exile is going to begin uh, around 539, 538 BC. Uh, that's not a 70 year captivity. The 70 years is from the destruction of the temple all the way to the complete, completed rebuilding of the temple in 516 BC. So that's going to be our 70 year captivity. It's the 70 years when there is no temple standing. Once Nebuchadnezzar dies, the kingdom of Babylon begins to go downhill, and it begins to go downhill rather quickly. And added to that is a new power that is beginning to arise, a power of the both the Medes and the Persians, and that comes to fruition uh, with the rise of a king by the name of Cyrus, who, according to tradition, uh, his father is a Persian and his mother is a Mede, and so he takes these two kingdoms and merges them into the, what we are going to call the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. Cyrus is attacked by the Lydians and Cyrus responds by marching all the way to Lydia and capturing uh, King Croesus uh, at the famous uh, Battle of Sardis. Uh, Sardis is, is uh, located way up high on a cliff and the story goes that as told by Herodotus that uh, Sard the, Sar the city of Sardis had been surrounded by Cyrus and the Medes and the Persians, and uh, they're looking at this uh, huge cliff with uh, the fortress on top, and not knowing how they could possibly get up there. Um, and uh, while they're looking at that, one of the soldiers uh, happens to drop his helmet off, and it goes bouncing all the way down uh, to the bottom of the wall, and then all the way down to the cliff. And and so the soldier sort of looks around and then he climbs over the wall and climbs down the cliff using a hidden pathway that wasn't immediately observable to anybody from down below. Uh, that night, uh, Cyrus uh, sends a, a contingent of his Medes and Persians up the same path over the city walls and captures the city, captures Sardis, with nearly without a fight. Um, hundreds of years later, um, in the New Testament, uh, Jesus would uh, give a message to John the Apostle, who writes in the book of Revelation, a letter to that same city of Sardis. And he says to that city, wake up, not because uh, you have invaders from the Medes and the Persians, but wake up because of the spiritual decline that you are suffering. Well, once Lydia falls, that leaves the Medes and the Persians uh, in control of nearly everything, from India all the way uh, to the Mediterranean. And Babylon is the last city to fall, and does so in the year 539 BC. When Cyrus comes to the throne, we read in Ezra chapters uh, 1 verses 2 and 3, uh, he issues a proclamation, and we have a recording of it here. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who's in Jerusalem. Now, it sounds like this as though maybe Cyrus is a believer. Um, although we have found the same testimony, the same statement made by Cyrus, not just to the Jews, but to all sorts of other national peoples with other gods. In other words, he comes on the scene and he says, I'm the great liberator. Any of you who have been dis dispossessed by Assyrians or Babylonians, you can all go home. Be happy. Don't forget to send in your taxes. We're going to be one happy empire. He goes on to say, Every survivor at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for, which the house of God, uh, for the house of God which is in Jerusalem. Like I said, he gives the same sort of statement, not just to the Jews, not just about Jerusalem, but to many different peoples as he, as he portrays himself as the great liberator of mankind. 
Now, Cyrus, has, what he's done, he's given the Jews, as I said, other peoples too, but he gives the Jews permission to go back, and they are given permission to go back and rebuild the temple. And they do that. Well, not all of them do. Actually, it's a fairly small percentage of the larger Jewish population, but, but a number do. They go back in the days of Zerubbabel. They are led by one of the descendants of the kingly line, that is a, a, a descendant of King David. He doesn't, he's not going to be a king. He's just a leader. Maybe we could call him sort of a, a local tribal leader, not even really a governor. Uh, but they go and they begin to rebuild the temple. And that goes on for a while. But then in the days of the son of Cyrus, Cambyses, the construction is halted. And it's halted because of some of the political maneuverings. There is a, a governor up in Samaria. And initially he said, oh good, I like temples. I'm going to help you guys build your temple. And, and the Jews say, well, we, we really can't have pagans involved in this. Uh, thank you, but no thank you. And, and he gets offended. And so he takes action and has the construction halted. And the temple stands there in a state of disrepair, in a state of half constructed and half not, for years and years and years. And it's not until the days of another king, when the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, suddenly get up, and they begin to prophesy and urge the construction to begin again. Now, the, the Jews don't have permission to do that. They've been forbidden to, to continue with the rebuilding by the king of the entire empire of Persia. But Cambyses, in the meantime, has died. There's a new king on the throne by the name of Darius. Now, he hasn't said you can build. He hasn't said you can't build. But without permission, Haggai and Zechariah, and if you want to know f specifically what they say, you just have to read the books Haggai and Zechariah. We'll, we'll do that when we get to them. And they prophesy and urge the construction to begin again. And the Jews obey the voice of the Lord. They begin building, even though they don't have permission from the emperor of Persia. And when news gets back that they are building, you know, there's a call, wait a minute, are they, are they rebelling? And the king, the new king, whose name is Darius, he orders an investigation to be made, not only of the action of the Jews, but an investigation made of the records concerning uh, the past status of this temple. And he finds out that Cyrus had indeed given permission. Darius says, okay, you can, you can have permission, continue the work, complete the work, and not only that, but the local taxes are going to help pay for it. And so the temple is completed in the year 516 B.C., 70 years, I won't say it's necessarily to the day, but, but exactly 70 years after it had been destroyed. Now, when we look at the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, one of the things we need to note is the books are not necessarily written, or, or those three books don't necessarily take place in a straight chronological order. That is, the first six chapters of Ezra detailed the return unto Zerubbabel that we just described, the rebuilding and completion of the temple. Those years from 538, um, 539, uh, Cyrus actually comes on the scene and then he gives his edict uh, very early the next year. So 538 to 516 BC, which is when the temple is completed. You turn the page in the book of Esther and you jump forward something like uh, 50 or 60 years. However, what has taken place between chapter 6 of Ezra and chapter 7 of Ezra are all the events described in the book of Esther. So if we were reading it in chronological order, we would read first the six, cha first six chapters of Ezra, then we would read Esther, and then we'd pick up Ezra again and, and pick up again in chapter 7. Now, that would not be a topical arrangement, but that would be a chronological arrangement. However, because the Bible's presented the way it is, we're going to approach it topically instead of chronologically. So we're going to do the same thing. We just talked about what was in Ezra chapters 1 through 6. Uh, as we go now to Ezra chapters 7 through 10, a number of years passed, and now we see Ezra the scribe, and he is involved in bringing another group 
of returnees back to Jerusalem, and they get back to Jerusalem, and there's, you know, uh, people are back in Jerusalem, the temple's been rebuilt, but, but everything isn't quite as orderly, and that's what Ezra is doing. He's calling the nation to sort of finish up its repentance and to put sin uh, outside the camp. And especially there was a problem of intermarrying where the priests would begin to marry, take wives from other folks who were in the land who, who were not Jewish and who might not have the same religion of the Jews who are worshiping maybe other gods. And so there's a call to purity that takes place when Ezra comes on the scene. Next we get to Nehemiah. Now that's short on the hills of Ezra. As Nehemiah, he occupies an important position in the government of the, of the Persians. He's cupbearer to the king, and that's not just the guy who waits on tables. That's, that's, uh, we would call him maybe Secretary of State or something like that. Uh, and he gets permission to take a sabbatical, to take a hiatus from his duties, and he leads a third return. So we've actually got three returns. Remember how we had three um, three times where the Israelites are taken away into captivity. You know, we could call it three captivities. Not, uh, first Daniel, then Ezekiel, then uh, the general population. Likewise, we now have three returns to the land. First under Zerubbabel, second under Ezra, and now I'm going to refer to this as a third return where Nehemiah comes back, not, not with a giant group, but a good-sized group of people. And under Nehemiah, the walls of the city are now restored. The walls of the city of Jerusalem are rebuilt. And this takes place around 445, 444 B.C. Now, the next book we're going to look at after this is the book of Esther. As I said, it takes place uh, there, you know, in between the first half and the last half of the, of the story of Ezra. But, but now we're going to look at the Esther narrative. First of all, we ought to note the cast of characters. First of all, there's Esther. Actually, her Jewish name is Hadassah, uh, but she, she has a, you know, both a Jewish name as well as a non-Jewish name. Uh, I guess you could call it a Persian name. Uh, Esther, or named after Astarte, that is one of the, you know, I guess, what the, what the Greeks would call um, Aphrodite and the Romans would call Venus. They called uh, Astar. Uh, and so the, it's a it's a pagan name. Then there's the king, and he's going to be called Ahasuerus. And most scholars agree this is the same king that the Greeks know as Xerxes. I'm not even going to try to pronounce his, his Persian name. I would mess it up terribly. Uh, but we'll refer to him as Ahasuerus, and he's the king of Persia. Thirdly, there's two other characters. There's Mordecai who is the relative to Esther, maybe a cousin, maybe an uncle, you know. Uh, and then there's Haman, and Haman is the bad guy. He's the villain of the piece. Now, the story begins where a new queen is going to be selected because the old queen, well, didn't quite measure up. She, you know, went through a little rebellious period and... and Husbands don't like that. In this case, the king doesn't like that. And so he's, he wants a new queen. And to do that, he's going to have a beauty pageant. And Esther wins the beauty pageant. And she's going to be the new queen. And Mordecai is uh, all excited about that. And he, he's uh, sort of hanging around the palace whenever he can send mes a message to his cousin. And in the process, Mordecai overhears a plot to assassinate the king and, and Mordecai sends in a report and it, the, the guilty parties are arrested, captured, put to death uh, and, and Mordecai has effectively saved the life of the king. However, there's a problem and that is Mordecai, when he's sort of hanging around the outside of the palace, um, he doesn't show proper uh, respect, at least in Haman's opinion, to Haman, and, and Haman, is, Haman begins to get a little upset at Mordecai and his, what he sees as a lack of respect, and he's not groveling on the ground and, you know, what have you. And so Haman decides he's going to, he's going to have it in for Mordecai, and not just for Mordecai, but for all of Mordecai's people. He wants to just not only take out Mordecai, he wants to take out 
everyone who is Jewish. And now he doesn't know that this new queen, that, that, that Esther is Jewish. In fact, that seems to have been kept a, a closely guarded secret. And so Haman is concocting a plot, not only to kill Mordecai, but he goes to the king and he sells the king on a plan. He says, look, you know, if you got rid of all these Jewish people, we could go, go in and take all the things that they own. And they're sort of troublesome anyway. And they rebelled against uh, their, uh, the, you know, the Babylonians in the past. And, and you don't like people who rebel. So if you will proclaim sort of anti-Jewish day and we can go kill all the Jews, then we can get all their stuff and get all their money and you'll have lots of money in your coffers and you won't have to raise taxes and you'll be a really popular person. And he sells the king on, on this plan, which really doesn't speak too highly of the king, uh, but that's okay. Um, and so this is his plan for what we call in nowadays ethnic cleansing. He's going to, he's concocted a plan that will result in the death of not just Mordecai, but all the Jews. And Mordecai goes to Esther and says, you know, you've got to do something. She says, I can't do anything. Uh, you know, I'm only allowed into the king's presence if he calls me, and he hasn't called me in quite a long time. You know, he's got all those other wives and concubines and things like that, and, and he's, he's busy with other things. And he says, you know, it might be for such a time as this that you were chosen. Now, an interesting thing about this, God is never mentioned directly in the uh, Esther narrative, but but if we're saying, Esther, you were chosen for such a time as this, somebody did the choosing. And so I think the idea of God is there and his providence. But God isn't specifically mentioned. And so Esther finally uh, agrees. And meanwhile, Haman's uh, been developing a plan. And Haman's plan is that on a certain day, uh, and, and word's already gone out for this, that on a certain day, uh, all the Persians would just, you know, attack all of the Jews and kill them all and get all their stuff. And, and that way they can... Uh, increase the taxes without anybody having to actually pay the tax, except the, the the dead Jews who won't really, you know, mind that once once they're dead. And and Haman has uh, a gallows already set up for Mordecai, and and he's really uh, he's really you know got all this taking place. Meanwhile, one night the king can't sleep, and. Uh, he, he you know he does what you know some people do when they can't sleep. You get something boring to read. And in this case, he's got uh, old news reports and, and old palace files that, that are being read to him, including including this time when Mordecai passed the word about the assassination attempt and saved the life of the king. And, and so the king gets uh, calls on Haman the next day and says, uh, Haman, uh, what would you do for somebody who you wanted to just honor and shower with glory? And, and Haman is thinking, well, he must be planning on, on honoring me. And, and he says, well, uh, O king, you know, this is what you ought to do is, is take such a person and dress him in, in the finest, you know, clothes and, and put him on your horse or your chariot and, and sort of parade him through the city and say, this is how, this is how the king treats somebody that's in his great favor. And, and Haman's already sort of sizing himself up for a new suit of clothes and, and thinking how well he would look on, on the king's chariot or the king's horse. And, and the king says, that's a great idea. I want you to do that for Mordecai. Mordecai! I didn't want to do it for Mordecai, but, but the king's already spoken. Meanwhile, Esther has invited the king to a party. And then, and when he came... Uh, has invited the king to another party, sort of softening him up, and Haman has been invited too. And 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 Haman's thinking, well, uh, that that last thing didn't go so well, but maybe this will go better. And and Esther reveals that the king has been put into the position of putting her to death because she's Jewish. And the king didn't know that. And the, the king goes out to check on things and, and comes back. Meanwhile, Haman has is, is come to, the, to Esther and, and said, Oh, no, you've got you've to help me. This is, looks like it's going bad. And, and the king walks in and, and thinks maybe he's doing something improper uh, to his bride. And uh, the king says, You know, well, we're going we're gonna to do away with you. And, and uh, some of the servants say, Well, you know, this gal is outside. And, and before he knows it, Haman has been strung up on his own gall gallows. So that at the end of the day, the Jews are delivered. Now, the word's already gone out that they can be attacked, but, but another word goes out saying that they can defend themselves. And that takes place 
and the Jews are delivered. And instead of dying, it becomes a great victory for them. Now, when we get to Esther, and I've just given you sort of a superficial overview of the story, we get to Esther chapter 9, verse 24. We read, For Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite. And this is not the only time he's described that. It's repeated several times throughout the book of Esther that he is a Agagite. And you wonder, what on earth is an Agagite? And if you remember way back in 1 Samuel, we ran into somebody named Agag. He's called the Agagite, the adversary of all the Jews, had schemed against the Jews to destroy them and had cast pur, that is the lot, to disturb them and to destroy them. And if we remember that connection, that explains what is the connection of the book of Esther to the early, earlier historical narrative. You see, Haman seems to have been a descendant of Agag, and you're supposed to remember that. He's been described that in Ezra 3, chapter 1, and, and all throughout he continues to be referred to as Haman the Agagite. And Agag was the king of the Amalekites whose life Saul had spared in disobedience to the command of God. That time when Saul was rejected from being king by God, by Samuel. The central figure, figure there had been Agag, the enemy of the people of God. And now, by contrast, we have the actions of Esther and and Mordecai, both who are from the tribe and family of Saul. They are not only Benjamites, they are Benjamites directly related to Saul. And Mordecai and Esther are going to be the savior of the people of God. So that the book of Esther is a redemption story, not just saving the Jews, which it does, but overturning that bad thing their ancestor had done, Saul, in the past, who, allowed, who initially tried to allow Agag to live. And what he had done in the past now has come back to haunt the Jews. And remember, if Haman has his way, not only will all the Jews die, but if all the Jews die, there will not be a Messiah, because the Messiah had to come from the seed of Abraham, from the tribe of Israel, from the family of David. And so, if Haman has his way, there will be no Messiah. And if there's no Messiah, then we're all dead in our sins. So, what is at stake is not just Mordecai and Esther. It's not just the Jewish people. It's the entire human race. And this becomes the story of the salvation of the world. Some points to ponder. Esther is the book of God's providence. As we said, God isn't even mentioned. But he has his hand in it. And he's working out the details as God still works out the details of our lives. And this, as we pointed out, the success of Haman's plot would also exterminate the seed through which Messiah would come. So Esther's story is our story. It's part of of what God has done for us. And this book reminds us that God works in the lives of both the great and the seemingly small. Indeed, somebody wrote a book on with this title quite a few years back. There are no little people. Everyone is important. I think also we see a picture of Jesus. In the story, Esther was the virgin bride who married the king, and, and the church in the New Testament is the spotless bride who marries the king. In the Esther story, the queen's former wife had been displeasing and had been set aside, and, and we read in Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11 how the natural branches were broken off due to unbelief, so that we, some of us who were Gentiles, could be grafted in. In the Esther story, Haman plotted against Mordecai and against all the Jews. And, and we know that Satan has set himself against Christ and against all his people. Indeed, I would say against all mankind. In the Esther story, Mordecai convinces Esther to intercede on behalf of 
her people. And, and we have an intercessor. Jesus himself interceded on behalf of his church. In the Esther story, Esther agrees to intercede after the people have fasted for three days. And of course, Jesus Christ interceded on our behalf and then was in the grave for three days. In the Esther story, Haman plans to have Mordecai executed for not bowing down to him. You remember how Jesus was tempted by Satan to worship him, and, and, and Satan's attack culminated on the cross, which became not our defeat, but our great victory. In the Esther story, Haman met his end on the gallows that he int had intended for Mordecai. And in our greater story, Christ intentionally went to the cross that was prepared for us, that was deserved by us. He died our death so that we could live his life. And that's the greatest story of all. In both cases, that which looked like certain death and defeat was turned into ultimate victory. Our victory.